First Chronicles 28. And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the captains of the companies that ministered that minister to the king by course, the captains over the thousands, the captains over the hundreds, and the stewards, that's the first time that word shows up, over all the substance and the possessions of the king, and of his sons, and the officers, with the mighty men, with all the valiant men in, unto Jerusalem. David is calling a general assembly. Everybody we've, we've been reading about, all the officers we've been reading about, all the courses, <laughs> David now called everybody forward. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build an house of rest, peace, for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. In Jerusalem means city of peace, Salam. And remember, when this all began, David looked out of his house of cedars. He saw the ark is amongst curtains. That's not good enough. Why am I sitting in the house and that thing's out there and just curtains? And that's what David's attitude was. Something wrong with this picture. And for the footstool, that's the first time that word shows up, of our God. Imagine God putting his feet up. God, you know, God is so mighty, just this little building that Solomon is going to build, this is God's footstool. And yet, but think about all the places where Jesus laid his legs and his feet. One time he, he, he took the disciples, he sat them down, and he took up their feet and he washed them. They had to put their feet on some kind of stool or something for them to do that. And I don't think you can keep your foot up that whole time while he's washing, or he put their feet on him and used God, Jesus Christ, as a footstool. And had made ready for the building. But God said unto me, Thou shalt not build an house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. David wrought great victories. God, David took care of Israel. You, you know, it's something I read when you read through the life of King Saul. It seems to me, and I haven't studied it enough, but I, I'm going to make this statement. I, I think it's safe. It seemed like every time that King Saul went to battle, his army was trembling fear. They're scared. And here comes this little shepherd boy. And he comes out and says, I'll take care of him in the name of God. And from that day forth, David, by the power of God, gave victory to Israel. When their king couldn't have the victory, he enjoyed the victories King Saul did. And from that day forth, not counting the, the lion and, and the bear that he protected the sheep, but that man he killed for the name in the name of God, he can't build that house. Now, you would have thought at that moment, David, let someone else kill Goliath. You stay with the sheep. You know, but God stopped me. No, God's not going to stop you. And there may be things that God will have us do as God was, had David do. He's a mighty fighter. He's, he's a king after God's own heart. But then again, there are things you can't do. And as a Christian, you can't go, you're going to, you can't go conquer all the world, take down the giants. And then listen, this temple is going to be a giant. It's not, it's not David's giant. It's his son, Solomon's son. It's his Solomon, his son's. Let somebody else be to work for the Lord. And yet David can lay up the gold, he can lay up the iron, he can lay up the breath. He can be a help. But shed much blood. Howbeit the Lord God of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. You say, what about King Saul? The Bible says that was the people's choice. Look how tall he was. The Bible says he was head and shoulders above the people. And when Samuel went to the family of David's brothers, oh, look how great. And the guy's like, uh, uh, uh. Oh, look how great. No, no, listen. You look on the outward appearance, but I, God, look on the heart. And we've already did with that big hype man who's a wimp, who couldn't keep track of his asses. Now I'm going to have a man, David, who, who took care of his sheep, who fought for his sheep, who's after me, who is for me, with me, and not against me. That's the one I want. 
to be the ruler of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, he liked, yeah, he liked, that's the first and only time that word shows up, me to make me king over all Israel. Liked. I guess Solomon wasn't much of a Facebook person to be liked. That's funny how that's the only place that word. And it's not like liking me. It's an action. And all my sons, for the Lord have given me many sons. Notice that little parenthesis there. You know, God gave me all these sons. David, you had a lot of wives. <laughs> you had a lot of wives. And a lot of his sons gave him a hard time. And he has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit upon the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. So Solomon is the one. And he said unto me, Solomon, thy son, shall build my house and my courts. So it's more than just the house, it's courts. And I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. We talked about that before. That's a type of Christian right there. David's a type of Christ. Solomon's a type of Christian. Here we are. God is my father through David. God is my father through Jesus Christ. And when you are adopted, and Solomon has been adopted into God's family, adoption is more liable in law in many states than it is to have a a birth child, whatever, your natural child. You got a child that's been born of your loins, and you got an adopted child. There's more laws for that adopted child than that that has been born of you. And look what God does for us. I've been born of Satan, created by God, but turned over to Satan, and been adopted by God through Jesus Christ. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever. And then when it comes to Jesus Christ and the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, it's David's throne. Solomon is going to mess up the kingdom with, with all kinds of gods. If he be constant, that's the only time that word shows up. If he be constant to do my commandments, he won't. And my judgment, he won't. As at this day, as I'm doing right now, look at David. David the murderer, David the adulterer. Look what he says. I've kept the, I've done right. And God will say, as we go through Chronicles, we go through Second Chronicles, David, a man after my own heart, a man that did what he was supposed to do. And sometimes God will throw in there, except for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Yeah, that's still there. I don't think I ever seen David have any pride. How's your church and pastor doing? Pride is not a sin I hear out of the pulpit. America's in great pride. Pride. That flesh. More rival establish his kingdom forever. Well, <laughs> there's no kingdom right now, so they must be in a lapse. If he be content to do my commandments and my judgment as at this day. Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord. And in the audience of our God, not only is Israel here, but here is God. Keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess it, this good land, and they won't for a while. And they'll get it back for a while, and then they'll lose it for a while. And then they're kind of in it, but not in it, and everybody else is in it. And then the, the Antichrist will be in it, and then Jesus Christ will come and put them in the land. And leave it for inheritance for you and your children after you forever. Be the new earth. And thou, Solomon, my son. Here is before the congregation turns to the son. This will be the second time that, that David has addressed Solomon. One time is Solomon in him. A couple chapters back. Now, it's Solomon and the entire people of Israel as a witness. David has called more than two or three people. Know that know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart. He will for a while. With a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts, and understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. Now, isn't that a scary idea? Verse 9. Yet yeah, that's not preaching in pulpits. 
You ever have a thought you should have never had? You ever been thinking what you should not have been thinking? Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after in his heart, there's a heart, there's a heart, has already committed adultery with her. Uh, Joab's brother is also charged with one of the murders, and he didn't do it. What we think and what we do, God's going to judge. When we think, it's just as much as doing. And that's the trouble when we get with our dreams and the daydreams and our nightmares. We got to put them under the blood. We got to stop causing our mind to go into wherever land. We got to put our mind in captivity. And there's a part in the test of Paul writes, controlling our thoughts. We are able to control our thoughts. Maybe some people can do it better than others, but there it is. And your thoughts don't come from your head, it comes from the heart. So when you go to see a psychiatrist because you got bad thoughts, you got bad ideas, and he's dealing with your head, you've already started off on the wrong foundation. Now, I'm not going to eliminate all psychiatry because there are some things that people need help. Body chemistry and, and events in life, I'm going to say. But a psychiatrist can't get anywhere if he's not going to deal with the rent, with the two main functions of mankind, your heart and your sin. All imaginations of thy thoughts. If thou seek him, he will find, yeah. If you seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And, and Solomon doesn't get that. But in true reality, if you forsake God, he's gone until you repent and get right. Even Ahab got right with the Lord. Take heed now. Pay attention, Solomon. Pay attention. <laughs> Take heed. That means pay attention. When you get the Bible, heed. <laughs> Pay attention. For the Lord has chosen thee to build an house for the sanctuary. So that's the courtyard, and there's the house, the temple in it. Be strong and do it. Notice how David says, and house. How about the house? David's a prophet right there, because there's going to be Solomon's temple. There's going to be Ezra's temple. There's going to be Herod's temple. There's going to be the temple in the tribulation period. There's going to be the temple of Ezekiel. Not just one temple. It would have been great if Solomon's temple is still there, still working, still doing. But it's not. Then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern. That's the blueprints. That's blueprints. Now, let's add a question chapter 22 verse 1 now this is a question I don't know Twenty-two. David said this is the house of the Lord God and this is the altar of the burnt offerings for Israel uh, my question is is he holding the papers is he waving them I mean I, you know what I mean here they are and when you read that with Moses too, and when Moses begins to start building that tabernacle, God tells him in Exodus, make sure you follow the pattern that I have set before you. I think so, because it, it's kind of hard. Because then he, he must show the, the blueprints because he set the masons to rock the stones. Yeah. Look at Exodus 25, 9. There is a blueprint of the heavenlies. And NASA's not going to find it. Exodus 25, 9. When you look at that tabernacle and that temple, and the layout, it's the universe. What's the first thing you see when you see a brazen burning fire? That's hell. What's the last thing you will see? You'll see the, Ar the Ark of the Covenant. You'll see the, the mercy seat. You will see the holiest holies. In Exodus 25, verse 9, according to all that I, God, showed thee, Moses, after the pattern of the tabernacle, 
and the pattern of all the issues thereof, even so shall ye make it. You say, well, that's the same one Moses has. Uh, Solomon's going to have ten tables, ten lampstands. He's got a brazen altar sitting on twelve lions. Is that the same one Moses had? Absolutely not. So it's not the same pattern handed from Moses down to David, now given to Solomon. But the basic concept is, here's a brazen altar, hell, here is the universe, the water, here's the holy place, heaven, and here is the most holy place, God. And you don't get to God by coming through and over the walls or over the, the linen sheets. As you'll find in the book of... Uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's on his way to the Celestial City. He sees these guys coming up over the wall. You know how stupid that would look at, at Moses' tabernacle? Here they are doing it again to see these guys coming up over the sheets. That's wrong. So he says, the pattern of the porch and the houses, plural, thereof, and the treasures thereof, and of the upper chambers thereof, and of the inner parlors thereof, and of the place of the mercy seat. There is so much more there than Moses. That place of the treasuries, we saw that the other night in uh, Mark chapter 12 and John chapter 8. That treasury is the place where Jesus was. You see that woman over there putting money in there? And then John chapter 8 says he taught. There was no treasury in Moses' tabernacle. And the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit, there's the Holy Spirit. You want to talk about God wrote, I mean, man wrote the Bible. Well, yeah, by the inspiration of God. Those blueprints are the inspiration of God. I don't think this folded blue paper came down and landed in David's lap. I think God told David and told Moses, this is how you draw it out. Maybe God handed the paper. I don't know. But there it is. Inspired blueprints of the Holy Spirit. Of the courts of the house of the Lord. There was no courts. Plural. There was one courtyard with Moses. And all the chambers round about. And when we get into that, it's going to get confusing. Just like Ezekiel's, I mean, if you don't know anything about architect and you don't know anything about building, you go through there like, Where's the exit? The, uh, the chambers round about the treasuries of the house of God. No, it's plural. And of the treasuries of the dedicated things. Each of these places have a room, have an area. Also for the courses, which we learned the other night, of the priests and the Levites, and all the works of the service of the house of the Lord, and for all the vessels of the service of the house of God. You know what that is? That's chapter 27, chapter 26. Six, chapter 25, chapter 24, everything that David just wrote, he's handed over to Solomon with the blueprints. What we have read and studied, David's handed over the writing. Solomon, here's the blueprints, and here's all the courses I laid out. It's in writing. David wrote it, and yet it's in our Bible by the Holy Spirit. Yes, man, yes, man wrote the Bible. But it was breathed by God. That's what inspiration means. Breathe from the mouth of God. Uh, verse 14. He gave of gold by weight for things of gold. For all instruments of all manner of service. Wherever it was gold, it was gold. Silver also for instruments of silver by weight. For the instruments of every kind of service. Silver instruments were not to be golden instruments. And golden instruments were not to be silver. Gold is deity. It pictures king. pictures God. It pictures holy of all holiest. Silver pictures redemption in the Bible. I bought it back. I redeemed you. They are not the same colors. They are not the same materials. They don't have the same value. Even the weight of the candlestick of gold. And for the lamps of gold. Now notice lamps. There are seven lamps. Plural. But look how he says, by weight, the candlesticks. Moses had one candlestick with seven branches. Solomon, I believe, is going to be ten of them. 
I know there's 10 tables. But I weigh every candlestick, every candlestick. And for the lamps thereof, and for the candlesticks of silver. Silver? I thought Moses was gold. What happened? I don't know. But that was a golden candlestick in Moses. And it says candlesticks of silver. Yeah. So there's there's silver ones. Or that maybe wasn't... just the little ones that you have to light areas. I mean, we got different things here. Remember, gold is deity, that's God. And silver is redemption. And the, and the book of Revelation speaks about candlesticks being churches. You know what the church is? It's been redeemed by God. By way, both for the candlesticks and also the lamps thereof, and according to the use of every candlestick. Hey, we know what a candlestick is to be used for. <laughs> a light. And the holies of holy lights that table of bread. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And by weight, he gave gold for the tables, plural, of showbread for every table. And likewise, silver for the tables of silver. Oh, now we got tables of silver. And tables of gold. Interesting. And pure gold for flesh hooks. And for both flesh hooks, where you would put that animal, where you would, how you butcher animals. And for bowls, collecting blood, collecting, washing, and for the cups, that's the first time that word shows up there, cups. Isn't that interesting? We held out Pharaoh's cup, but plural. And for golden basins, he gave gold by weight for every basin. And likewise, silver by weight for every basin of silver. It almost looks like here, David said, this amount of gold goes to basins. That silver, it looks like David may have put forth by the treasuries, what that treasury was to be used for. And for the altar of incense, refined gold, by the way. We had pure gold over here, now refined. That pitches the prayers of the saints. Your prayer is to be refined. Your candlestick, the light of the word, the, white, the light of Jesus Christ is pure. Ours is to be refined. Look over your prayers and what you're praying for. And gold for the pattern of the chariot of the cherubim. That's something interesting there. Chariot? Go look at the try to find that in Exodus. Only chariots you read about in Exodus is uh, the Egyptian chariots, and they were drowned. That spread out their wings and covered the ark of the covenant of the Lord. That's the same. All this said David. The Lord made me understand. The writing by his hand, here we go, upon me, even all the works of this pattern, write that down as inspiration. There it is. God directed David to draw what and to write out. Chapter 28, chapter 27, chapter 26, chapter 25, chapter 20. That's all by God, inspiration, written by David. And God says, just like he told Moses, we are seeing the same story of Moses and that tabernacle as we are seeing David with the temple. When Moses was on that mount for 40 days and 49, I don't know which one, probably the second time, he's up there, and it's, I'm going to say, and I, I'm going to stick my neck out, like John, I think Moses was in heaven like John. And he's looking around. Okay, this goes like this. That goes like that. This goes like this. Is that right, guys? That, yeah, that's, okay. Now take those instructions and go down there. John, take those instructions and go down there. Maybe, I, I'm going to stretch my, maybe David went to heaven. I'm, I'm not going to even, I will not go that far, but I know one thing. God showed David what the prints were and how to draw. There it is. There's the verse. There's inspiration. No textbook is written by God. But wherever these blue, you want to find something? Go find these blueprints. You're not going to find them. Besides Mr. Jones, I know where the Ark of the Covenant was, and the Nazis didn't have it. It's in heaven, according to John. Moses and Elijah would tell you, because that's where they are, ready to come back. 
And David said to Solomon his son, be strong and have good courage and do it. <laughs> do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. You, you know where that's written? You have any idea where that's written and rest quoted? At least one particular place? How about Hebrews? My, uh, the Lord has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. That was Hebrews, which is the Hebrews, is written to Hebrews. And it's, it's quoted, uh, I think, to Abraham. But that's an interesting study. You want to find in Hebrews where it says, my, uh, the Lord said, I'll never leave thee for safety. Get a concordance, run that references, and it's to Jewish people in the Old Testament. Now there's application in Hebrews for the Christian, but it says Hebrews. Say what you will, do what you want. Hebrews. I think we know what Hebrews are. Now, Scripture can be applied doctrinally, it can be applied historically, and we can uh, apply, you know, for lessons of our life. But that's one of the places it says, you know, I'll never leave you forsake you, and David said it. David being a type of Jesus Christ. Fear not, be this day, for the Lord, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Uh, wait, I got a note here. Let's look at Joshua 1 5. This, that's the other one I'm looking at. Joshua 1 5. I thought I was going to have the Hebrew reference. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. And this one right here has a reference to Hebrew 13 5. I'll never leave thee for safety. That's where it is. With this, Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. And then you go to Hebrew 13 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I, God, was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will never fail thee nor forsake thee. And Hebrews 13, 5 says, and the Lord said, I'll never leave thee forsake thee, talking to a Jewish man. Now we have that surety, yes. We have the security. These things have been written to you that you may know you have eternal life. We are part of Christ. Until thou finish all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. And when he finishes the work for the service of the Lord, David's a prophet. Because that's when he starts getting married. That's when he starts worshiping all these gods. He starts building temples to the other gods. He starts building, erecting all kinds of things for the other gods. But we already studied in scriptures, God is not going to forsake him because God says, I adopted him. But does forsaking mean that God's totally done with you? Not for a Christian. I can be saved and be pure and saved and do nothing and lose my soul. But if I go out and live like the world and live devilish and do whatever I want to do, and not care about the Bible, not care about the Lord, he's not going to walk with me. But I'm still his. Psalm is going to go out and, and commit the deplorable sins. And God, all he does is send correction, sends chastisement, sends enemies to get him back to correct him, like Hebrews chapter 12 says. A father corrects. But he never abandons as far as Solomon for eternity. And behold, the courses, which you just read the other night. Of the priests and the Levites, we read that the other night, even they shall be with thee. So it's written down. It's written down. We read, we read what David wrote down. With thee for all manner of workmanship. So what we read is for workmanship. Every willing, skillful man, as for those who are willing and want and have the ability to do what we read and studied. For any manner of service, whatever service you want to do, Solomon, I wrote it down. Also the princes and all the people were, will be holy at thy commandment. I, he turns the government over to Solomon. Okay, all you people right now that are under my authority right now, Solomon's now your king. Turns it over to Solomon. 
There's a there's an overlapping reign of Solomon and David. Solomon does not take over the reign when David dies. David's still living and it's turned over to Solomon. Thanks to his elder brother who tried to usurp the authority. And the, and the prophet comes in and says, get Bathsheba. Say, hey, you know, and he makes Solomon the king before he dies. 